Okay. Testing. Yeah. I'm trying not to kill anybody. Yes, yeah, the slightest thing. So, are we ready on the yeah, video? All right. So, I'm Nancy Snoke. And I'm Phoenix Snoke. Y'all can hear us okay, right? Good. And our talk is a case study of hacking the Internet of Things. Um, so, first, um, my husband's never given a talk at a conference before, so make sure you ask him the really hard questions. I don't know. <laughs> don't worry, though. We've got a, a signal worked out, so if I get in trouble, she's going to do this. So if I miss that, just point it out to me. <laughs> All right, so probably the most important thing is um, we have some candy with our contact information on it now if you all want any, some assorted chocolates. So. You, um, and we were happy to pan out, as well as a contact information slide later. Um, just let them pass it around. Yeah. And Sorry about that. It was a further run than I thought it would be. Um, additionally, we've got some cards here, so you know, don't feel like you can't eat the candy without ever being able to talk to us again. Um, Sorry about that. Um, but yes, if you look under the wrappers, it'll tell you what those are. So if you decide that you don't like that, you know, maybe see if you can trade with the person next to you. You could end up making a new friend, and uh, that's kind of what this is all about anyway. Okay, so. Uh, we're going to then start with a small introduction, look briefly at any security standards for IoT. Uh, then we'll talk about our methodology for what we did and um, our results. And we'll end up with setting up your own IoT lab and to have time for contact info and questions at the end. So why a talk on the IoT? Um, well. If we want to go search news stories or something for this, we can see that two-thirds of consumers are concerned about the IoT. Um, they're always questioning why there are huge security flaws. Uh, there's worms destroying IoT devices, botnets controlling hundreds of thousands of them. Can we actually prevent Skynet? Can an IoT device ever be secure? Uh, the other thing about this is that this is actually a really large market and it appears to be growing quite rapidly. And additionally, uh, there doesn't really seem to be a lot of uh, concern from the companies in terms of uh, post-purchase support. And uh, there doesn't seem to be a lot of concern about security either. So some of these devices are shipping out with uh, pretty glaring security vulnerabilities or they're being discovered later and they're not necessarily being fixed. I mean, this whole thing, it's, you know, it's all fun and games until you find out that your coffee pots help take out the internet on the East Coast or, you know, things like that. So everyone else is hacking IoT devices. Why shouldn't we? Um, so we had to look at what IoT device we wanted to hack. Our first choice was a smart light bulb, not this one here. It was a different one, and it totally did not work. What we discovered after we bought the one that we bought is that apparently the manufacturer decided that they were going to post, um, their, at some point after they released the product, they were going to patch in functionality. So the device was shipped not working whatsoever. Uh, since the device couldn't connect to any networks or anything, obviously they couldn't patch it either. So this thing was just completely dead and they apparently had no intention whatsoever of going back and fixing it. So, I mean, this kind of goes back to what I was saying about how the post support on it, once they get your money, is not necessarily that good. We did get a very expensive light bulb, which we're using just as a light bulb. Um, nice <laughs> um, so, we decided after that being burned on that device, do a little research before we picked out our next IoT device to try to hack. And we next thought about getting the egg tray. That was smart. It will tell you when you run out of eggs. but 
it seemed a bit tedious because you had to actually take them out of the carton and move it to the smart egg tray for it to work. And, um, well. They needed a robot arm or something that would just lift the, the eggs up for you. Oh, and then we were look, looked at the Nest thermostat because we thought that might actually be useful, but there's so many talks that are actually already out there on that when we did some brief looking. It was just like, uh, everyone's already done that, so we should go on. There was the Internet-enabled Crock-Pot. Now, this is kind of interesting to me because I'm um, fire. I mean, uh, there's a uh, personal appeal to me to uh, be sitting in Eastern Europe ruining your dinner. Um, additionally, since, again, there, there, there's heating elements on this, I wasn't really sure if there was something that you could do that could be potentially um, really showy. But um, apparently, my wife is a little against burning down our house. And then this one, I, yeah. I mean, I figure the type of person that wants to uh, put this type of information on the internet probably is going to. Um, but uh, this is sort of a side note about the, the whole thing with the security flaws. These devices, uh, they're, they're mining enormous amounts of data on people. So they're getting all this information about your private lives. And uh, there's a problem because they're not doing this in a manner that's secure or they're not necessarily storing it in a manner that's secure. So there's a lot of bad things that could obviously happen. Uh, people, I guess, could know what your rectal thermometer temperature is. <laughs> so then we looked at the smart water bottle, which makes a lot of sense because who knows, it tells you when it thinks you need to drink water because you don't know when you're thirsty. Um, it glows nicely at the point when it doesn't think you've drank enough water recently. Uh, so it seemed like an interesting idea, but a little too weird. And so we eventually chose a baby monitor. So why did we choose a baby monitor? Well, last fall, we kept getting all these suggestions from companies to buy a baby monitor. Um, Amazon, Target, Babies R Us, Bye Bye Baby. They all said we should get a baby monitor, maybe because we had a cute, adoring baby at home around January. But, oh, yes, that one's better. <laughs> but um, so we did a little research and well, first we said, why would we want one of those? And then we said, well, we could hack it, because we didn't actually want to use it to monitor our baby. Um, <laughs> so we looked on Amazon. We found this one. The name has been blacked out, obviously. Um, and we read the description. It did seem a little insecure from the description, reasonably priced. And it was a number one bestseller. So another reason to look at this one. Um, but before we jump into what we did with this device, we'll segue briefly for um, some security standards or what there is out there, which isn't much, as far as I know. Um, Pony Express does the Internet of Things, the Internet of Evil Things report, which does talk about a bit of the state of security on Internet of Things. And um, basically, everyone knows uh, that Internet of Things devices are extremely risk prone and have security holes and nobody is spending any money to mitigate the risks is probably summing it up quickly. There's a lot more statistics in it. And then last July NIST put out their special publication 800-183 called the Network of Things where they divide um, each thing into five pieces and they sort of give a basis for um, how to write about security but it doesn't actually get to the security standards yet. And so the five pieces were the sensor, the aggregator, the communication channel, the external utility, and the decision trigger. And the sensor was your hardware, the aggregator was software, like firmware on the device, and your communication channel is obviously your network, your Bluetooth, whatever, with your external utilities being your mobile apps or web apps. And the decision trigger was whatever software tells it to, for example, in the smart water bottle, glow when it thinks you need to drink water. Um, and then Microsoft has a document for their Azure IoT platform, which is very, in many ways, it's very Microsoft specific, saying use such and such Microsoft thing to help. Although there is some threat modeling information that can be generalized in it. But as far as I know, that's all there is on IoT security standards. So before we started testing, a couple things we did was first just obviously look at the packaging and read the manual, uh, set up a test network, and brainstorm our ideal attacks that we wanted to try. So the packaging, um, on the 
bottom left, I believe it is, you'll see. It's bottom right. Okay, the bottom right, <laughs> there's um, where the QR code is that I blacked out a bit. There is the ID number and a default password admin. You'll see on the box. <laughs> yes. Uh, it wasn't quite as bad as that once you actually start using the device. Um, but yes, that was like, okay, first vulnerability default password admin. Um, we read the manual. There's a ton of information about how the authentication works, which is nice. Um, and the authorization. Apparently, so that's not actually your account to log in. Um, you have to make a separate account for yourself with a password. And you add each device. And each device also has a password. Um, they don't have a forgot password mechanism. If you forget your password, you're supposed to create a new account and re-add the device. Um, which does save them making secure forgot password functionality. Um, and if you forget your device password, you need to reset it to factory default if you've changed it and you can't remember it. So um, obviously, you could add each device to many accounts with this sort of scenario. And um, there were also talked about guest permissions. Um, so there, you could have a guest camera permissions where everyone could just view it as opposed to do any changing. So that was the gist of what was in the manual. The other thing I was going to point out here is that um, the other problem with the way it was set up on the if, if you got locked up an account because you forgot your password there was no way to kill the account so there was you could potentially have a dead account that somebody could find and access the cameras and you would never necessarily know it so I did want to say one more thing on the um, default password admin it wasn't as bad as it looked because it did force you to change it when you first set up the account it said that you had to have a, at least a six character password for security. Six characters. Six is all you're ever going to need, right? Anyhow, um, for our testing purposes, what we wanted to do was that we wanted to have a separate network for this. Since we don't know how insecure or secure this device is, we don't want to put it on our personal stuff and have it take out any of our home things. Yeah. Uh, this part's pretty easy. Um, this and the other network section, I realize I'm probably going to be saying things that a lot of you know, since I'm sure a lot of you have pretty good networking backgrounds. So um, given where we are and everything, and since this is a talk, I'm kind of gearing this down towards people who might be starting out on this or who are trying to learn about it. Uh, additionally, if you have any questions about what I've done or any of this, you can you know send me an uh, email or whatever, or you can hit me up while we're here. But um, basically, what I'd recommend is that you might want to do a little bit of research on the router you get just to make sure you aren't getting something that has a really uh, bad known security vulnerability in itself. Since you're looking for an insecure device, if you're looking for an insecure device on an insecure router, you might end up going on some goose chases there that end up wasting a lot of your time. So I would just probably avoid like your uh, weird off-brand Alibaba type stuff. Okay, so next we wanted to come up with what our ideal attacks were before we got going. Um, and this way we knew what our ultimate goals were at the end. And we thought of trying to um, fake the device pairing in some way um, so that we could be paired with a device we hadn't actually officially done the pairing with. Or also uh, we liked the idea that they always do in movies and TV shows of sending fake videos to the web app or something so that you see something that's not actually in the room. Um, and the idea was that we would then go through testing like normal and after enumerating all the bugs and vulnerabilities we found, we'd see how we could daisy chain them together to create one of our ideal attacks. Um, so. We thought there were five areas of an IoT device. You can divide this any way you want, um, but we decided to do it this way, into the mobile apps, the network, the web app, the API, and the hardware. Um, and Phoenix is going to talk about the network and the hardware, and I'm going to talk about the mobile apps, the web app, and the API, which all sort of go together. And um, we were trying really hard not to break any laws here. So things that were external, like the external web application and the API calls and the external network, we were uh, mostly observing or very lightly testing um, to make sure, with careful thought to make sure that it wasn't something that broke any laws. So, um, so I'll start with the mobile app methodology. Um, basically, for both Android and iOS, you have three pieces, the static testing, the dynamic testing, and the network testing. 
the static testing in, is completely different for iOS and Android, even though it's the same thing. For Android, you actually get to decompile it and get the Java code and look at it. So nice and easy to read. For iOS, you have to um, go through a bit of trouble, or there's some programs that do it for you, and actually get the bit code and look at it through IDA or Hopper, you know, reverse engineering. So not as fun and easy. Um, then you do dynamic testing of the running application. And for Android, that's mostly using the Android debug bridge and attaching it to a debugger, et cetera. And for iOS, you use a lot of SciCrypt um, and other debugging methods. And for network testing, it's I use Burp Suite for both. And I don't actually have a slide about the network finding, but in both of them, they don't verify certificates at all. So it's completely man in the middle. Well, you can just attach Burp to it, and you don't even have to copy over the CA. So I didn't even bother mentioning that in the slides, but I thought I would here. Uh, some quick findings. Um, there's insecure data storage, insecure communication, insufficient cryptography, extraneous functionality, and improper platform usage, to name five of the OWASP top ten for mobile that they had wrong. Um, so not going to look at everything we found here because there was too much. Um, but a couple things uh, that I liked. Here is a line of code in the decompiling where you see how they validate the device number. And so you can pretty much enumerate all the devices if you wanted to. It uh, starts with the same six characters and is 13 characters long. So you know that you have seven characters exactly, and that's how it validates whether you have a correct device. There is this great line of code where you see there's a default uh, hard-coded developer password to get to the developer options. I did black out the actual password to some extent. Um, then also in the source code here, I found, I know, um, I have a sort of a nemesis in cryptography that seems to show up everywhere I look. Um, it just is like, ever, I don't know why. At first it was sort of horrifying that people were still using this. And then I, it's now it's just sort of like, of course. <laughs> I'm going to find, anyone want to care to guess what what algorithm that I found in this app? For What? Uh, no. It was um, something mentioned in the 1983 movie War Games, I believe. Des. <laughs> now, uh, so. Yes, they do at one point encrypt a password, but they use single DES when they store it. Um, that's the ones they do store encrypted, which, as you see here in a shared preferences file, um, it, they don't store the account passwords encrypted at all. That's the device password they encrypt. So the, um, yes, when I test, I choose things like Nancy test 2 and Nancy test 1 as my usernames, and Nancy password 1 and Nancy password 2. So. <laughs> Um, and that way I know exactly what it is. Nancy password 2 means it was my second password. So I know that's what I found. Um, but yeah, there is more stuff. This one's probably harder to read um, in that was open. But here is where you can actually see the DES encrypted password for the device, as well as it has um, a whole bunch of URLs for where it makes the API calls. It has another way to set the developer options on here, so it will, if this says yes at a spot, it will just load the developer options. Um, and several other things. We won't go into all of that. Um, I did access the developer options, obviously, uh, because there was the hard-coded password. Um, or you could just turn it on in the shared preferences, or you could use Activity Manager in and just turn it on that way because there was no uh, access control. And there was also, as I said, there's not supposed to be a forgot password mechanism, but they had one that was built into the code that you could get to. Um, so there was theoretically wasn't, but they had this extra code sitting there that would do the functionality. Um, that was just some of the, there's actually a ton more findings, but I don't want to take up the whole talk talking about the mobile. So I'm going to give this to Phoenix for network. Yeah, another thing about the uh, web app, too, is that there was a lot of uh, code for functions that shouldn't have been there. Uh, so as far as I can tell, it looked like they had cut and pasted a bunch of code from different devices. 
Uh, from what I gather, this is actually somewhat common. Uh, anyhow, for the network methodology, again, I'm kind of doing this from a uh, more of a beginner or trying to learn level, so I'm sorry if I'm going over things that a lot of you already know. But, uh, you know, this is going to be basically like a, your regular uh, pen test. What you want to do for the beginning is you want to do your reconnaissance. You want to know what it is you're looking forward to attack and where it is. So for that, you know, I'd use NMAP to uh, map the internal network. And then you also want to look at your traffic. I was using Wireshark to see it. Uh, you could use TCP dump to capture the data if you wanted to. I was using Aircrack because I was using an external modem and setting it into promiscuous that way. It's just, with a lot of these things, there are multiple ways you can go about doing it. So I really don't want to tell you this is the correct way to do it. If it works for you, it's obviously the correct way. So for our network findings, when I started to do the reconnaissance on this and figure out where everything was, there was a uh, web server at port 80. Um, additionally, there was this, this 8600 uh, port for Asterix. Be honest with you, I've never seen Asterix before I, I got to this. Had no clue what it was. Um, I went and did an online search for it. It's apparently something, uh, some sort of protocol for aircraft control towers. Um, so what I'm assuming is that Nmap just returned me a, a false result. Uh, I ended up just sort of writing down, hey, check this out later because this is a little weird. Um, so again, since this is like penetration testing, what you're really going to want to do is that you're going to want to document what you're doing in some way because you don't want to end up duplicating effort that you've already spent or forgetting to go over stuff that you, you know, made a note to go over later. Uh, in terms of the traffic, there was absolutely no encryption whatsoever. Anybody could look, could look through the camera that was within range. Uh, the only encryption that was there was what was the, set for the router itself. Very secure. Additionally, there was a setting to turn the device itself into an access point, and you could do this remotely. Um, one thing about that is that there was absolutely no way to set a password for it and no encryption whatsoever. So you could set this to a uh, router with no password and no encryption. Additionally, if you had it in the regular Wi-Fi mode, it would tell you all the networks that were within range. Again, you could do this remotely. Um, it's beyond the scope of this talk, but there are attacks that people have done where they can take this information and locate the physical location of the device. Yes. Because it's the Internet of Things. It's going to the cloud. Um, additionally, when I was searching for this, there are about a dozen portals for this device for various company names and everything that this sends the data to. Uh, some of them are data mining companies, some of them are camera companies, some of them are just random things in China. Um, but let me give this to my wife so she can discuss our web application methodology. I'm, I'm sorry, what was that? Yeah, that's kind of my, my, my problem with these devices is that, yeah, they're, they're mining all this data on you and there's no security safeguards whatsoever. And so, you know, if you've got like a, uh, an ex that's crazy and stalking you or things like that, or, you know, other companies that just want to figure out things about you, it seems like this is a really uh, big personal security issue to me, but I don't want to sound too paranoid there. So everyone's probably familiar with normal web app methodology and so that's what you want to look at and this is for the internal web application he found as well as the external web app of course being careful with the external web app not to do anything illegal um, so you would look at the authentication the authorization session management whether you can inject anything the client side code all of that um, so my first finding was rather on accident. As a joke, I nicknamed the device to be script alert one slash script, and it apparently did actually execute that um, <laughs> as a cross-site scripting. Um, I was totally not expecting that. Um, on the external web application, if you went to the page and just looked at the base HTML JavaScript there, it was doing something rather Odd, which enumerated some test sites. Um, it basically was like a frame, and it said, if you're trying to access this host name, then go to this IP address for the data. And there was this list of like 20 of them. So it was like this company was using the same page to 
do all the data for some reason. But yeah, I found there was a test website. And on the test website, they had these great download options. And so you could actually download the APK or the iOS, or they had a Windows and a Mac uh, version of the software, as well as an SD tool that you could just download. Um, I didn't really want to do much here, but uh, I thought it was interesting that they just had an out there on the regular net a test website. So then the client side code was what was really interesting because almost everything was done in the JavaScript except for a Flash a, a plugin. So the JavaScript would basically make all these API calls to the back end, and yeah, they were completely um, designed there. And then there is the Flash plugin, which of course you can reverse that and take a look at it. And the Flash plugin was what was used to play video for the camera. And um, basically, you could see it getting sent a URL for the stream. And um, then that would be sent to this. And it was basically an RSTP protocol, but it had some authentication built in the front of it. And um, so it was an interesting thing that they were doing there, I thought and that we could build on that later. So, and the URL was sent in one of the API calls, I should note. So it's sort of hard to differ, differentiate the API from the web app here. Um, so moving on to the a API methodology, um, as I say, it's very similar to the web app, except you have no app. But first step is to see if you can enumerate all the API calls and then you want to check for the common problems of APIs, which are similar to those, but like transport layers, security problems, IDOR, access control, sensitive data exposure, et cetera. And what we found in the API um, is there was the complete enumeration of the API in two different places that was easy to find. So you could find all the calls it was capable of making. Um, one of them was in the mobile app and the other was in the JavaScript. And then we could replay API commands, and they ran perfectly, um, even like a week later, so there was no expiration. Um, and then after trying replay, I checked to see if we could change the information in them. And some of them, that would work, and there was no integrity checking. And other commands, it did not work, and there was integrity checking. So it was just sort of random. I'm not sure, or possibly even an accident that some of the commands didn't work when you changed the data, since everything else was so bad. I didn't want, but so we went through all the commands that we could do and checked which ones could be um, changed and which ones couldn't, and made a list of that, is what I did next. And oh, also there was some interesting information disclosure um, in some of this. Like, for one, it sent back this where uh, there's a debug telnet address that it gives you for some reason. Uh, no, because I was afraid that that might cross the line on breaking laws, but I really wanted to see what it was. We, we really don't want to get nuisance lawsuits. It was just like, what? I, I just was like, why are you sending this to my device telling it this? I, I had no clue. I mean, I think it was being sent because it also lists the NTP server, but you didn't have to tell us where the debug telnet is in the same line as the NTP server. <laughs> so, um, and with that, we'll go to the hardware. Um, we're only gonna lightly touch up on the hardware methodology in part because uh, everything we would have done for, with the hardware methodology, we were able to actually do uh, with other methods. So again, it sort of goes into how there are usually multiple ways to solve a lot of these problems. Uh, so whichever one works for you best is obviously the correct one. But um, at the basis level, what you're going to do is you're going to take the device apart and see what it is. We did this last, obviously, you know, just in case we uh, destroyed anything. Uh, in theory, you could buy multiple devices. We didn't really see a whole need to get a whole lot of uh, insecure baby monitors. But um, one thing you probably going to look for if you're starting out is um, look for a debug UART port. Uh, what you'd want to do is that that's where you'd want to connect if you're trying to get to the firmware. You could use a, a TTL to USB 
and then like run it to like a Raspberry Pi or an Arduino. Um, one thing I want to caution on some of the hardware stuff is that in theory you could end up spending a whole lot of money on some of these tools. So you, if you're really wanting to get into this, you might want to see if there's like a 2600 group or a makers group or something in your area where, you know, people might, you know, be able to not only loan you some of this stuff or really use it, but they also might be able to help you kind of figure out how to do it in the first place. But we wanted to look at how the firmware worked. So we needed to get a copy of it. We wanted to see if you could, uh, if you could install your own software for the firmware and if there was any sort of signing or integrity checks, so, you know, to see if you could maliciously alter the firmware. Now, for the hardware findings, I'm sorry, I took a really bad picture there, but there is a, a, a UART port there. It's very clearly labeled. It's the one with the four holes there. I believe it's next to the two wires by themselves. But again, uh, a lot of these things are usually going to be pretty plainly labeled. Um, some things, I'm not sure if you can tell from the picture, some of it was in Chinese on at least one side of the board. But that would be where you'd want to connect um, there. Now, on the web app itself, there was an online way to upgrade the firmware. Uh, additionally, if you're going through the internal portal, there was a way, a way to upload your own firmware. That certainly is a very secure thing and could not be exploited for evil. Um, but when we did the online upgrade, what it did it was it sent the, the firmware directly to the camera. It didn't give us like a, a bin or an EXE or anything to install. It, it, it went ahead and sent it directly to the camera. We were able to intercept the internet, uh, the, the network traffic though, and extract it from that. Just what it did was it actually sent in, there was an API call it sent out to an external address, and then that external address contacted the camera with the software is exactly how that went. And yeah, by his monitoring everything, we got the uh, firmware. And again, since a lot of these checks uh, to, to verify if the camera was real or anything don't really work, I'm sure you could see where there are some obvious security issues there. Did you want to do this? Okay, so um, also, I don't, did you actually mention that we were able to upload firmware without it checking the integrity? Um, yes. So then we wanted to put together one of our ideal attacks, which we talked about at the beginning. Um, and we decided to go with the uh, favorite of movies and videos um, of putting in a fake video. And um, so as it was, we could easily man in the middle the data from the network. And the API calls were not checking integrity. Um, and the stream for the video was sent in one of these API calls. And we knew that there was some authentication in the front, but we could fake that um, based on reverse engineering the flash. It was only validating the client had to send the right things, but the server didn't have to send the right things back to the client. So we could fake all that. And so we put together a video that was from our baby monitor. That is not my adorable, always hungry son. Um, additionally, there. Uh, I didn't. I didn't put it on here. I'm sorry about that. But there, the timestamp function was done through the web portal itself. It wasn't attached to the file in any way. So if you're using this for still images or video, the timestamp, if you had it set, that it was returning was the current timestamp of the web portal. So if you're taking older video and re replaying it as current, to to the user, if they weren't being careful, it would look like it was actually accurate. Since this is a device that would be used for physical security. Um, this isn't just an, an InfoSec problem. This is a, pro you know, a very serious potential problem for physical security as well, since you can get on there remotely, you can move the camera around the room to see if somebody was there. Uh, in theory, you could use the uh, networks, since it was listing networks out, to find out the physical location of the camera. So you could go to somebody's house, look, see if they were there, and just all kinds of bad stuff potentially there. Okay, so our conclusion about um Internet of Things hacking was that they're really easy to hack. And um, we did do some research on this after the fact. We didn't want to do it before because we didn't want to um, let let other people's work influence what we were doing or anything like that. And we wanted to, you know, do, do the stuff ourselves and kind of has, has sort of learning tools too. But um, uh, out of all the cameras I looked at after we, we had got done with this, this was the most secure one. I did not see a single one that was more secure than this device. 
So um, that is a very comforting thought in and of itself. Most of them had things like um, a telnet on the camera with a default root password or that sort of things that we looked at. And, and in most cases, the default root password then couldn't be changed with one, two, three, four, five, six. Yes, it did seem that was seen in multiple devices. And in some cases, those were also broadcast within the camera traffic on encrypted. Um, so, so yes, very easy to hack. And as we said, it's the number one best-selling device on Amazon. So lots of people are using it. Um, but so now we're going to talk about setting up an IoT hacking lab. Ours basically looks like this, but we have a few more cats. Yes, a lot more cats. Um, but basically for your IoT lab, it's setting up what you need for each section and having all of that on hand is the idea. So to start with things for an Android, you obviously I shouldn't even mention the computer except that you want an Intel processor because of the hardware acceleration for the emulators. Um, and for you also need to get a copy of Android Studio and the SDK tools. You want the Android emulator with several versions. And I think it's good to have both x86 and ARM on hand because sometimes there's a native library that you need to run on ARM. Um, in fact, that was true of this camera. If when you originally install the APK on an x86 emulator, it doesn't work at all because it needs a ARM library. Um, obviously, you're going to need things like ADB, um, which will give you the activity manager shells and ways to get things to and from your emulator and uh, to allow you to debug it on the computer. Um, Android devices are, of course, nice to have. Um, but you don't actually have to have them. You can actually hack Android without one because the emulator is really good. Um, as far as the things you need to for static analysis at, the, analysis at the beginning, basically anyone who's done this before knows you use APK tool, dex to jar and JD GUI or another Java decompiler, um, and you get your code. And I always use Burp Suite, but whatever web proxy you like for the network. All right. Yes. Oh, yeah, there is that. Um, for iOS, you have to have a Mac, unfortunately. Um, or if you like Macs, that's great. Um, but the cheapest one's a Mac Mini if you need to buy one. Um, and of course, you're going to run Xcode, uh, which has the iOS SDKs on it, and the simulator, and OTool, and some other things you need. And you absolutely must have an iPhone for your iOS lab. I always ask all my family and friends to hold their old iPhones for me um, as a way to get them. So, uh, and you need to jailbreak that iPhone, which is illegal in some countries. So, don't mention that to me. If you're in one of those countries. So um, you, then you need something to get the data off. Um, so iFunbox is great before iOS 8.4. Um, some other tools are like IDB, Burp, Ida, Hopper, um, SciCrypt, and Snoopit are all things I sometimes use. And there are lots of other tools out there. Most of them you can get from your jailbroken iPhone from the Cydia, however you say that, C. You know, the C-Y-D-I-A app store. <laughs> I always mispronounce things like that. So. Uh, now, in terms of the network tools, um, you want to have an extra router so that you can keep everything separate from your uh, home stuff since you don't want to, you know, introduce potentially insecure devices into your home network. Uh, we already discussed that. Um, additionally, if you want to do any sort of network attacks or if you want to log uh traffic in promiscuous mode, you're going to want an external USB adapter. Uh, alphas are, are, I've never heard of anyone not using an alpha. I know the other ones exist, but uh, if you're not sure what, what you get in terms of specific hardware there, if you look at Aircrack NG's website, they actually do list um, hardware that's compatible with, the, with Aircrack. In terms of the uh, software, the, I didn't have to really do anything there. I was using tools that were actually in built native to Kali, uh, Wireshark, Aircraft NG, and uh, TCP dump. But um, that's pretty much it there. So for the web, whatever you normally like for web test tools, I don't want to uh, 
dictate and everyone has their own thing, but obviously you need a web proxy scanner. I use Burp Suite. Um, other scanners like Nick2 sometimes give you some good information. The development tools for Chrome or Firefox. I use Firefox for testing, and so I always use the Firefox development tools. And there are many other things you might want um, to use. Uh, there's a gigantic list of web application things. I didn't want to put them all on here. So um, that's just a few of them up there. And API tools are basically going to be the same things as a web, except you want some specific extensions or components for different APIs, like WSDL is going to need different things than JSON, et cetera. Um, and also just a note on that, uh, for the scanners, for uh, the vulnerability scanners, you would be using that against like the, the web server I found, you know, so I'd be mean, just, just to, you know, kind of elaborate there. Um, now in terms of the hardware tools, you're going to want to get a screwdriver set. Um, ideally, you're going to want to probably get something that has uh, what are usually called precision screwdrivers. You know, get the smaller size ones because a lot of them have very tiny screws. Uh, additionally, if you have like a hardware tweezers of some sort um, or things that you can usually get from like lock picking stores for, for that, the, you know, just some, something to make your life a little easier. Uh, you're going to want to solder an iron, obviously, solder or solder remover. Now, um, I wouldn't recommend trying to do this as your first soldering project. Uh, I heard somebody chuckling with the soldering thing there, yeah, because uh, soldering is kind of like a painting or drawing. You you might have a really good idea of what you want to do, but there is kind of a skill that's to it that you want to learn, so I would probably suggest trying to actually solder something easy first so you don't destroy a device inadvertently. Um, additionally, you know, you could get like a TTL to USB cable, which would be what you would do if you're going to try to uh, you know, mess with the firmware at all there. And then there are other things that are nice to have, like, you know, bus pirates, Raspberry Pi, Zardos, logic probes, et cetera. Um, this is something where, again, you can end up spending a lot of money. So um, if that's a concern or something, you might want to see if there's, you know, other people local that, that could, you know, help you out with that. Additionally, again, that's also a good way for people to kind of tell you what's going on and how to learn it. And I'll, just one comment and then... Um, I was going to say, oh, if you want to get started in hardware, you could always check out Hacker Boxes. They have a nice starter kit, which comes with a lot of things. Um. I'm sorry about that if anyone couldn't hear me there. Um, you're going to want something so you can open the device up, obviously. Something so you can take it apart, you know, the solder and iron, desolder stuff. And then something so you can communicate with the device itself. Like, uh, additionally, you're going to want a multimeter so you can, you know, verify w what's actually, you know, power and such. But uh, yeah, there there are companies that do kind of cater to if you want to learn this, like the uh, HackerBox uh, group that Nancy mentioned. I'm sure there are some other things like that too. Quite frankly, I, I wouldn't be surprised to see people offering things like that at a lot of uh, InfoSec conventions. So if you want some further reading or some resources, uh, one book I really liked was The Practical Internet Things by Brian Russell. Practical Internet Things Security, sorry. And just some links to some things. Uh, that special publication by NIST, there's a link to that, or how you get the Internet of Evil Things report. And um, the Hack the World blog has a nice way um, for starting hardware hacking. I liked it anyway. Um, he goes through hacking a router step by step. Um, and with that, um, there's our contact information. And we'll take any questions anyone has. Yes. Um, I'm sure there was something that they did right. Um, can you think of anything? <laughs> um, one thing I was actually going to mention that that slipped my mind there when she was saying this, since we got uh, we're one minute ahead of time here, but um, when 
you're, when you were looking at the net, network traffic and it was saying if, if coming from such and such address go to here, it's because these devices are, a lot of these are rebranded and sold in multi, has multiple different vendors. So there's, a, there's a, actually a lot of overlap on that. Um, as I, I said at the beginning in the manual, they talked about the different levels of, there was an admin level to the camera and a guest level to the camera. They did the authorization for the guest level correctly. That actually was done correctly. You could not fake it. So. And, and they didn't make you change the password from that. Well, yes, but as I said, you only had to go up to six characters, but at least it wasn't the default. And, and when I did try to connect to open networks, when I set the, dev when I set the uh, device as an AP and tried to go to open networks, it wouldn't actually connect to any of them. Um, I'm not sure if that is really a security feature as much as just really bad network protocols. Um, additionally, when I did poke around, since we got a couple minutes here, um, I'm sorry, were there any more questions? Sure. To, uh, we, we, we had to do it through the internal web application, so you would have to be on the network to do it. Um, yes. No, it's not. I'm a pretty trustworthy person. <laughs> but um, a, a, additionally, one of the things that I noted when, when uh, that, the weird port 8600 thing, um, it looked kind of Telnet-ish to me, so I, I tr actually tried to access it with Telnet, and it, it connected. And so I went through the help to see, you know, hey, what is this? And um, the problem was it dropped fairly frequently. Uh, apparently, there is some proprietary authorization that runs on the same port number. So what I think the problem was is I think that they actually had some legacy code that they cut and pasted from another device. So they actually had multiple services trying to run on the same port. So, I mean, it's not really um, security through obfuscation as much as security through the device constantly crashing. But um, were there any other questions? Sure. Yeah, that be, wouldn't be a problem at all. Yeah. Yes, I've seen that. Yeah. So. Thank you very much for everybody's time. Thank, thank you everyone for coming. Uh, if you want to get a card or something, our contact info, uh, we'll be here for a couple minutes while the next person's setting up.